on today's show. What's all the hype about Wakeman Town from? What, what do, do you do, do on snow days? Who do you have in your final four? What's the story on that dress? Are you wild about weather? Last, Last weekend, weekend to see Sweeney Todd. Todd. All that and more. Good, Good morning, Staples. Staples. Good morning, Staples. It's Thursday, March 19th, and I'm Cole Toussaint. And I'm George Menz. We'll be kicking off our show with something that recently got everyone talking, but before that, would you all please stand for a uh, very dramatic pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Recently, a photo of a dress created an internet frenzy over its colors. One website that took a poll about the dress's color received more than 28 million responses. A few of our students asked the same question to some of our students here at Staples, and here's their report. A seemingly simple question for you. What color is this dress? Take a look. Take a good look. That question has been dividing families and friends all day. Tens of millions have seen it since it went wildly viral on the web last night. So many people asking, why do some people see white and gold? while others are just as sure they're seeing blue and black. Last week, this dress took over the internet. Here's what Stables had to say. Black and blue. It's blue and black. Blue and black. Blue and black. Blue and black. It's blue and black. I saw the report on NBC this morning. Did you guys see the... I didn't see it. It's amazing. It's blue and black. What the heck is all of this? It's clearly blue and black. <laughs> white and gold. It's white and gold. It's black and blue. What color is that dress? Hard to identify. I mean, it's white and it's beige on the picture. White and gold. Thank you. Okay. It's gold and white to me. Black and blue. Black and blue. Black and white. So, Staples, is it black and blue or gold and white? It's all how you perceive light. Now, let's throw it back to the host. So, Zach says it's all about how we perceive light. Well, that's science. And speaking of science, there are a few new science classes that we will be offering next year. Chloe and Olivia tracked down Dr. Sheets to find out more about these classes. Take it away, Olivia. We asked Mr. Sheets, the head of the science department, which classes they'll be adding next year. So in science, there are two new semester-long courses. Um, one of them is zoology and the other is animal behavior. Um, zoology is uh, kind of like a good complement to marine bio. I can imagine students who are really interested in uh, living organisms taking marine one semester and zoology the second semester. Um, animal behavior is a very interesting course. It might complement like a psych course that the students would take from social studies. Um, and um, uh, you know, so it'll cover a lot of sort of the different aspects of why animals behave the way they do, what's the evolutionary origin of those sorts of behaviors and so forth. And then we also have a third new AP course called AP Computer Science Principles. And this is a very interesting course. It's brand new from the, from the college board. As a matter of fact, next year there, there's no test yet. Um, so we're offering it as a pilot, essentially. Um, and that course is designed to be sort of like the first year college computer science course for non-computer science majors. Um, it's very interesting in the sense that uh, AP is probably not going to ask people to sit down and take a, a full test. They're actually going to ask people to submit examples of their work, like computer programming, and you know how they've extracted data from large data sets and those sorts of things. We also asked Mr. Sheets how they chose his classes to add. Well, the two semester-long electives, zoology and animal behavior, one of our teachers, Mr. Lazaroff, um, has a long-term interest in those subjects. And, um, really just decided to develop them uh, because he's interested in it. Uh, the computer science principles course, um, you know, we don't offer any computer science AP classes, so this new one is our first, um, first offering in that regard, and we're very excited about it because it has a lot of different uh, features that are unlike most other AP classes. To sum it up, the new science classes for next year will be Zoology, Animal Behavior, and AP Computer Science. If you are interested in any of these courses, talk to your guidance counselor about signing up for them. And now back to the hosts. Thanks, Olivia. 
One of our great science teachers, Mr. Aikenhead, is very involved with Wakeman Town Farm. There's a lot going on at Wakeman, as Spencer found out when he interviewed Mr. Aikenhead. What is Wakeman Town Farm? And it's an old farmhouse. It was sort of uh, a little bit of a, in disrepair. And so the town of Westport said, well, what are we going to do with this property? And so a bunch of community, community members got together and said, well, rather than tear the house down or make another ball field, let's turn this into a community asset and make it our town farm. And it's basically become um, an educational resource for the town. And it's a one-stop shop for learning about um, local organic food, how to grow your food, um, sustainable living, and uh, just an all-around great place to learn how to live a little bit more lightly on the land. Why did you go to Town Hall? We've made do with what we've had for the past three years, but there are serious things that need to be addressed at the property. The roof is uh, about to fail, um, there's not proper public bathroom space, and there's really not a, a working classroom for the programs that we've been running. It's a big project. Um, all told, it's probably going to cost around $650,000 when we've budgeted everything out. And the truth of the matter is, while we've been successful in maintaining the programs and so forth at the farm, we cannot afford that type of uh, investment. How can Staples students help? You guys can come and support the farm by attending any of our um, programs or activities, but specifically to this renovation, um, if there's families that support the farm and want to make donations, you can always reach out. Recently, Westport's Board of Finance approved an appropriation to renovate Wakeman Town Farm. Now back to the host. Next up, Staples Student Showcase. From time to time here at State Good Morning Staples, we like to feature some of the incredible things some of our students do outside Staples. These next two pieces showcase just that. First of all, here's a freshman at Staples that does a different sport than the usual 15-year-old, and he does it fast. Here's Clay to introduce you to another side of the person who just interviewed Mr. Aikenhead. Hi, my name is Clay Crouch, and some of you may not know, but there's a freshman here at Staples who doesn't have his license but drives all the time. I recently sat down with Spencer in an interview. Let's take a look. So, Spencer, can you tell me a little bit about how you got started off with racing? Well, um, you know, my dad did it for a living. And then at the age of nine, I started racing go-karts. And then I recently moved up to full-size cars. And um, I'm working to the top. So, uh, how fast does the car you're in now go? Well, the car that I'm in now goes about 150 miles per hour. And um, hopefully, if I make it to the top, the cars will be going 220 miles per hour. So, Spencer, how do you become a pro? Well, um, at the age of 15, I can acquire a license to be able to race a full-size car. And um, from there on, you have to, to run a pro series. You have to woke up to it. You have to um, kind of start in club series, regional series, and then finally show to the people that run the pro series that you're, you're strong enough and fast enough to be able to compete with the top competitors. And how does the sponsor work? Well, it costs a lot of money to run the series, so you can't just pay for it all by yourself. So I reach out to companies and say, I represent your company if you help fund my racing. So they will give me money to help me continue my career as I represent their company everywhere I go. All right, thank you. Wow, would you have thought a freshman could drive, let alone race? Best of luck as you move off the ranks, Spencer. Next up, a budding meteorologist. Here's Remy to introduce you to the guy behind the No Snow app. What's up, Staples? We're here with the Scott Pecorello um, of his famous websites, you know, wildaboutweather.com, and he has an app now called No Snow, predicting, you know, what schools are going to cancel. So, Scott, first question right off the bat, you know, may, people may say it's a boring question, but why do you like meteorology? It is a boring question. I mean, it is a boring um, question. Okay. But, but um, something about weather kind of just... just clicked with me and, and, and it's kind of a weird hobby a lot of people think it's weird yeah um but but i think i think storms are cool and, and uh cool. 
I like predicting weather. So yeah, predicting weather. Yeah, it's interesting. It is interesting. The way patterns work and, and stuff like that. So, you know, there was a recent storm uh, where they called it the blizzard of the year. Yeah. Predicting, you know, twenty five inches of snow. Yeah. Um, many people got that wrong. There were only like possibly five inches. Yeah. You got it wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was awful. But what do people do? You know, because like. You have a paid website and you have a free website. So what yeah. do people do in response to you getting the call wrong? Yeah, no, there was a lot of backlash. Um, uh, there were some people that were very, very cruel um, about getting the storm wrong. Uh, the paid site especially. A lot of nasty emails from some nasty people. Um, and you kind of just have to take it because... Because weather is, you know, it's unpredictable, but but you try to predict it, and, and every once in a while, you know, it doesn't go right. So this was one of those times, and it's unfortunate, but uh, it happens, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. So, Scott, you have these two websites, Wild About Weather and uh, No Snow. Yeah. How many followers do you have on each? Uh, on Wild About Weather, I have uh, 21,000 followers, um, which is up a lot from last year. What was um, last year? Last year was around 15,000 during the winter. Um, and, you know, with each forecast, there's, there's shares, and so more people see it. Um, and, and that's how the followers come on, on Facebook. And then on Twitter, uh, I just started using Twitter. And I have a little over 2,000 followers, so, so I'm trying to build that up. Um, and I have some other guys working with me now on uh, both of those sites to help build up the, the number of followers. And uh, then on the app No Snow, I have 2,500 downloads now, which is also up from last year. Nice. So two years ago, there was a student here named Jacob Mizell. Yeah. Right, and he was a young meteorologist, just like yourself. Yeah. So, was there competition, and is there competition? Because I know for me that I follow both of you guys on Twitter. Um, me and Jacob often actually coordinate um, on our forecasts. We collaborate um, on our weather forecasts, and and he's a great forecaster. He's he's up at Harvard now doing some weather and, and some business stuff. Um, and we actually do two totally different things. Um, he forecasts just for Fairfield County um, and I think parts of New York. Um, and I forecast for the entire Northeast and, and uh, my most popular city is actually in, down in Baltimore. Um, so two very different regions. So we're not really in competition. Um, we really collaborate on a lot of our forecasts, especially for uh, you know, school closings and stuff. Um, so so very, two di very different things that we do. And, and, um, and we have two different populations that we kind of have as our followers. Hopefully we're done with snow days, but just in case, you might want to download the free app called No Snow. That's K-N-O-W. No Snow works for both iPhone and Androids. So when it does snow, and you get that call from Dr. Landing, what do you do? What do you think other stable students do? Some of our journalists wanted just that. Here's what they learned. So today we went around school and asked people what they did on their snow days. Well, I'm a New Yorker, so um, I don't usually do these wet snow activities, but Jack thought of the cutest thing on our snow day, so we made these things called snow angels. It was so cute. It was so cute. Um, it was a hoot. <laughs> on snow days, the first thing I do is turn off the alarm and go back to bed. I love to sleep in on snow days. And then when I get up, I usually make a big, slow breakfast hang out, watch the snow, and then grab a book. On my snow days, I stay, I, uh, I end up writing a lot longer. I treat it like a regular day, a work day for me with writing, and, and I love it, spending the morning writing. Tell me when. You're, oops, I'm again. Okay, it's ready. Well, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but I am bored to tears on snow days. I'm home alone with nothing to do, and after watching TV and reading, and playing some games on the computer, I need to get back to work. So, um, on my snow day, I hung out in my room with my cat named Bo, and um, my mom came in, and it was, you know, it was nice. We all kind of just hung out, and she brought me some soup, and it was great. I wasn't sick, but I had soup anyways. And uh, yesterday, after the snow day, I found out that I was actually allergic to cats, which is kind of weird, because I have two. So, I guess I'm just gonna have to learn to deal with it. On my snow days, I watch movies. On my snow days, I drink hot chocolate and make a fire. This weekend is the closing weekend of Sweeney Todd, and so we will have just one more chance to tempt you into coming to see it. Show open, and this past weekend, the audience was on its feet at the end of each show. 
because of its assignment and huge success. Two of our reporters are part of the production of the show and have some highlights of this past weekend to show you. Hey Staples, Sweeney Todd just had their opening weekend this past weekend. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, here are some highlights. Sweeney Todd has two more shows this weekend on Friday and Saturday, both at 7.30. If you like what you see and you want to see more, come and check it out. Now let's throw it back to the host. So order your tickets at staplesplayers.com or you can buy your tickets in the lunchroom each day this week. But whatever you do, don't miss this show. Finally today, we're down to 64 teams competing for the NCAA Basketball Championship. Who's in your Final Four? Last night the brackets were finalized, so today we caught up with some students and asked them who they had in their final four. My final four is Notre Dame, Arizona, <laughs> Iowa State, and uh, Michigan State. Maryland, UNC, Virginia, and Iowa State. Kentucky, Coastal Carolina, Wisconsin, and Purdue. Kentucky, NC State, Arizona, Duke. I got Kentucky, Arizona, SMU, Michigan State. Villanova, St. John's, uh, BYU, and Kentucky. In my final four, I have Kentucky, Villanova, Duke, and Arizona. Ohio State, Kentucky, Gonzaga, and Virginia. Virginia, Notre Dame, and Duke. Gonzaga, Kentucky, uh, Villanova, and Arizona. My champion is Iowa State. NC State. Gonzaga. And my champion is Kentucky. I got Arizona. Gonzaga oh, winning it all. Arizona. I have UT for champion. Kentucky winning the tables. Have fun following your brackets starting this afternoon. That's our show for today. Next week we're hoping to bring you two shows for the first time this semester. Bye! Bye. Y'all ready for this?